you know, Ukrainians want to show the world who they are. You know, it's not about, I think it's a hard thing for Americans to see, but this is not about a government. This is about people. Uh, Ukrainians have plenty of frustrations with their government. Before we continue, we invite you to follow our channel, the only American show reporting live from Ukraine every day. It's Wendy in for Bob. Bob Surratt is back tomorrow, and we go live to Ukraine and check in with Joseph Lindsley this morning. Good morning, Joseph. Wendy, hello from Kiev, and uh, it's a, a pleasant day here, a little, much cooler than it was the past few weeks, uh, low 70s, and we're still in this period of uh, of calm here. It's been more than, than three weeks since a major attack uh, on, on Kiev City. Uh, and and this is, you know, as I said yesterday, the longer these periods of calm go on, uh, people wonder, OK, what's what's next? Uh, but even despite that, underneath the, you know, underneath that, uh, there still are serious electricity problems. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just that's not going away. Uh, uh, the the electrical grid is, is, is so broken here. In fact, uh, Penny Pritzker, who's the uh, U.S. special representative uh, for the recovery of Ukraine's economy, uh, she was here the past few days. It's her last trip to Ukraine. Uh, her position, interestingly, is expiring. Uh, her term expires in September. And it, so far, it does not seem that uh, Washington, either Congress or the White House, is going to renew that position. Uh, hmm. But she was talking about some of these challenges that Ukraine faces. Uh, she's, you know, right, and she pointed out that right now, 50 percent of Ukraine's electricity is coming from nuclear uh, from the nuclear grid, even though the largest nuclear plant in Europe and in Ukraine uh, is occupied by the Russians, but Ukrainians still uh, can produce nuclear power. But uh, this has been uh, th- this is one of the uh, one of the ways Russia has been able to hurt Ukraine uh, the most. And as I looked at uh, Penny Pritzker's remarks, and she seemed very sad that this is the last time she'll be here. Uh, she was, you know, giving her advice to Ukraine, and she was speaking a bit optimistically, you know, talking about the growth even in the past year in in, in the tech sector uh, here. And and indeed, I mean, I think uh, last year in 2023, because of all the wartime driven innovation, there there was a lot of growth here. And, you know, people, uh, you know, figure out how to tinker with drones and how to make them more effective. And that leads into other projects. And some of that has turned into businesses and you get investors sort of brave, uh, sturdy investors from the U.S. who come here uh, to 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 boost these projects. Uh, there also are total like entire teams of volunteers uh, in secret places uh, in the west of Ukraine from all over the world that make drones. Uh, they make them great drones. This is the group called the Frontline Kitchen. Uh, they started off making food, and now they're making drones. Jeez. Uh, and they can, they, they, they can uh, produce them at a very cheap price because they're all volunteers. And so you see this great innovation. Uh, but what uh, 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 Mrs. Pritzker, I think, was missed, was missed in her remarks and probably something she can't say. Of course, she is from Chicago, uh, is... Um, you know, for, for all the optimism you can see looking at the stats from the past year, uh, there's one glaring problem. And this I hear from many uh, business people to, uh, throughout the country, especially small to medium business, because of the new conscription reality, uh, it's very difficult to to plan for your business. I mean, not only do people start to lose customers, but especially, you know, the team that you were, the team of engineers or programmers uh, or designers that you rely on, it's very, you, you can't do that uh, because anyone can, you know, any male between the ages of 25 uh, to 60 uh, could be conscripted quite quickly. And, and then so it's very hard to plan for your business. Uh, you know, and this is I mean, there's plenty of roles. Uh, Ukrainian women are, have stepped up to do to do a lot of that. But but it, it does make it difficult to uh, to plan. And this has been, you know, a year ago, there were sort of glowing reviews from foreign entrepreneurs who came to Ukraine. You know how easy you know, you, people had every motivation to to do a good job. Uh, and it was very it was easy to hire people. Uh, and that reality is slipping away uh, because, you know, we can talk all we want about economic recovery. But if Ukraine doesn't have, crucially, the permission to hit Russian bases from which Russia attacks and co- constantly threatens Ukraine uh, and, and to have the, the tools to push the Russians back at the front line, uh, they're going to continue to bleed out. 
Well, three weeks of calm uh, at this point is great. We hope that continues. You also mentioned yesterday and brought to light the Ukrainian people um, looking at the Russians participating in the Olympics. And I never thought of it. There were um, a couple of Ukrainian athletes. Here's the news we have. Heavyweight boxing champion Alexander Yusik has come to Paris to support Ukrainian athletes. And and Ukrainian fencer dedicated medal to the countrymen killed. Are you up on this? Indeed. Uh, the fencer, uh, Oha Carlin, uh, she won, I, I believe she won the gold medal. Uh, and she uh, was, you know, she was overcome by emotion and, you know, dedicated that, of course, to, to her country. And then to have, uh, you know, I see that America has Snoop Dogg at the Olympics where Ukraine has Usyk, who, who's a big hero and well-loved throughout the country because he's represented Ukraine uh, on the international boxing stage. And, and, you know, these, uh, I think even, even this, this is important even for the guys uh, at, at the front lines to, to know that Ukraine, because, you know, people don't see what they're doing at the front. They don't see the extraordinary effort it takes. Um, and, you know, it's hard to see how much worse things could be if Ukraine had fallen and where would Russia be right now. But people can see uh, the, the prowess of the athletes. And, and so this is, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's important. It, it is something that matters. Even, it, I think when you're, you know, facing ballistic missiles and bullets. And, uh, you know, I think, and also to see the, uh, you know, Ukraine, Ukrainians want to, to show the world who they are. You know, it's not, this is not about, I think it's a hard thing for Americans to see, but this is not about a government. This is about people. Uh, Ukrainians have plenty of frustrations with their government. Uh, and, 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 and they, they don't, you know, they always are critical of leadership and, and those in, and bureaucrats, but this is really about, uh, about the people and who they are. And, and so much so, I mean, I, you know, you think about, I've been talking a lot with people about the differences between Ukraine and Russia and trying to define, you know, how, how we got to this point. And uh, probably I've mentioned this before, but even, you know, the Ukrainian word for victory is paramoha, which literally, if you break it down, it means overcoming might, overcoming your possibility. So every time you say to victory, you're saying we're going to do the impossible, uh, which is really what we're facing here. And the Russian word for victory is pobeda which means after the miserable things, after the suffering. So when the Russians talk about victory, it's in a very negative way. It's in the sense of we're going to get through this miserable stuff somehow, and that's the victory. But for Ukrainians, it's, it, it, it is this very Olympian ideal of, of saying, I, I, know, I feel what my limits are, and I'm going to try to go beyond it. That's literally the definition of victory in Ukrainian language. What number is this? How many days has Ukraine been at war? Oh, you're testing me. I should know. Well, just ballpark. Uh, I think it's 886 today of the full-scale invasion. Okay. Um, and, and so we're, we're, get, we're getting up there. And many of those days, uh, you know, we've been talking here. Uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing that the, the people of uh, Chicago, the third biggest city in the U.S., have followed along uh, with this story. Uh, and, and, you know, just 10 minutes a day. I think this is incredible. And I think if we're kind of in the the scene in a, in a superhero movie, like you look at Christopher Nolan's Batman movies, where the superhero is pretty bloodied. He's getting a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people criticizing him and, uh, and questioning him and encouraging him to, to give up uh, and, and, you know, saying you need to do this or that better. Uh, this is the phase of the superhero story that we're in right now. Well, I love talking to you. I love hearing you with Bob every morning. It's been happening for 886 days, ballpark. Um, is, what is your opinion? When do you think, um, do you think this will ever end, Joseph? Well, I, I go back to that definition of the word victory. Um, you know, if, for the Ukrainian mindset, it's doing the impossible and overcoming limitations. And I think you see that when, for example, in, in, in May, it seemed that Kharkiv was going to fall. And I know that for months, going back to at least January, uh, American reporters and American political people, they had given up on Kharkiv city. That's that second biggest city in Ukraine, one of my favorite places in the world, a vibrant city, but often attacked by Russia, 30 miles from the border. They'd given up on it. And I think they were kind of, many people were secretly hoping that Kharkiv could be exchanged after it was ruined. Uh, and then someone gets a Nobel Peace Prize. But Kharkiv refused to relent. And in May, that city was, be but it was being destroyed in May. And, and Ukraine and people who supported Ukraine put such uh, clear pressure uh, on the White House 
uh, hey, let us at least protect Kharkiv in a small way. Let us hit Russians on Russian soil, you know, where they're bombing Kharkiv from traffic jams uh, across the border in Russia. And finally, the White House said, okay, you can hit back in a very limited way. And that worked. And Kharkiv became safer. And so if we can keep building up in ways like that, uh, you can all of a sudden begin to weaken Russia uh, and move to, towards safer cities and eventually toward Ukraine. But what we see now is, even though we have a clear demonstration that when Ukraine can fight back, it, it actually works, Russia, instead you know, instead of uh, following through on their nuclear threats, becomes weaker. Uh, instead, we have no one talking about this right now, except for you know, Ukrainians. You know, why is there no permission? Uh, you know, if, if we show that it works in the past, why can't you give Ukraine permission to hit more Russian bases yeah. and begin to put an end to this? Uh, and so if there's not a change in Washington, uh, no matter who's in charge, they seem to all kind of, you know, despite the rhetoric, I think most people sort of deep down agree uh, in Washington that they don't want to push things too quickly for victory. So that if, if that can change, then this there can be there can be a, a, a good end to this. If not, it's, it's going to be a slow bleed as we're starting to see. Yeah. Well, I wish you the best. I hope the calm continues. Bob is back tomorrow, so uh, you will speak to him tomorrow morning. Uh, have a great evening, Joseph. Thank you so much. Thank you for introducing Ukraine on your social media pages. That's very important that much more people can get more information about the situation here and how everybody can help Ukraine to stay stronger and to save all the world. Значит, и стороны.